Where it's snowing at the moment. Where are you, Saeed? I'm in Oxford, where it's bright and sunny, but you wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> so this is the first in a series that we're calling Tools for Transformation. And Saeed pointed out that uh, social labs aren't really tools per se. Um, it's more about how we set the conditions for um, the bringing tools in. So I think that this will be very relevant for the rest of our series as well. We have an hour together today, and most of that will be Zaid sharing his work and his story. And um, this is somewhat new technology for us, so please be patient as we learn how to, to use it. Um, we're limited a little bit. We can only uh, do chat and questions. So as we go along, please type your questions in the question box, and every now and then we'll stop and you can share some of those. So some of you may know Zaid already. He's been connected to Olia for a long time. And um, and at the beginning, um, he, he began Pioneers of Change, which is a global network of, of young innovators with Mayan News, who many of you know, and went on to become involved with Generon, which um, involved people like Joseph Jaworski and uh, Peter Senge. Adam K. Hain, Otto Scharmer, many others, and was one of the founders of Rios Partners. And if you've been to all the programs, you've probably met um, some of some of the people involved with Rios, like Adam and Lenica Albers, Mia Eisenstadt. So um, Zaid today is managing partner of the Oxford office of, of Rios, and I'd just like to invite him to uh, share his work with us. So, welcome, Zaid. Thank you, Susan. Um, it's great to be here, and it's great to see, uh, in quotes, all of you here. Um, I'm going to, well, thanks for the introduction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, just some of the background on uh, social labs, and um, and then we're going to do a QA. and um, I'm going to actually try and go through the material relatively quickly, um, because I don't want to give a long uh, lecture to all of you. I'm quite keen to get into uh, the questions as soon as possible. Um, so we will do that. Uh, and um, and we'll see how long the questions go. So we've got two sessions scheduled of questions, so, um, but we may, uh, we may just run with the questions depending on what we get. So I'm going to kick off. So I'm just going to turn my screen on here um, so you can see my slides. Can, Susan, can you just check that everyone can see? Can you see the slides? Is that okay? Okay. So, uh, the, the title of this uh, uh, talk is slightly tongue-in-cheek, but it will uh, become clear as we go along. And uh, I, I just want to give you the punchline up front. Uh, so the, the argument I'm making with uh, this book and um, in this conversation, I guess, is that we've got scientific labs um, and labs of other sorts, like technical labs, medical labs, that we're all very familiar with. And uh, we need social labs to address social challenges. Um, so much of the work around social challenges takes place in laboratories that aren't really dedicated toward to solving problems that are social in nature. Um, so that's the case I'm making. Um, and what I want to cover uh, today, at least in this conversation, are a couple of questions. So social labs are uh, designed to address challenges that are complex in nature. And obviously, we hear the word complex used um, all the time. We hear the word complexity used more and more. So what does it actually mean for things to be complex? Um, when uh, I was writing this book, and, and the, 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 so the Social Labs Revolution is the, is the book that articulates this case. Um, one of the things <coughs> my publisher said to me, Barrett Collis, was that no one really wants to know, um, no one really wants to spend a lot of time on the problem. Uh, so a, a lot of books, what they do is they spend sort of ninety percent of time on the problem and then ten percent on possible solutions um, or possible approaches for how to address them. And this book is the other way around. Um, and having said that, uh, my feeling was that there is uh, a degree of misunderstanding about the nature of the challenges that we face. Um, 
and hence the responses aren't really congruent with um, the nature of the challenges. So, so the challenge, I guess, here is that. Um, I'll, I'll, so I'll talk a little bit about the nature of the challenge, and then I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the consequences. Um, uh, so there's a dominant response to the challenge. So how how are we responding to it, um, and why that doesn't work? Um, and then I'll get into what a social lab is, how do they work, and uh, why they're more effective. Um, I'm sure there's a level of detail that I will uh, not get into, um, and we can get into with the questions. So again, the request is just hold your questions. Um, and uh, we'll get to that as soon as possible. So, uh, just to start with, what is complexity? So, social labs are are, uh, are an approach that has evolved to respond to situations that are complex. Um, and uh, situations that are complex are crises, conflicts, um, things like climate change, public health care issues, financial crisis, um, education crisis. So all of these things are social in nature and that they involve multiple stakeholders uh, and they're complex. And what makes a situation complex or a system complex are three things. So the first is um, emergence. So the phenomena that you see is emergent. It's not predictable. And um, in my book, I use, a, I use a, an example of throwing a bird. That if, you, if you pick up a bird and throw it across the room, then the path of the bird will take is completely unpredictable, it's emergent. Um, so that's one one characteristic that these challenges are emergent. Um, and what happens as a result of the fact these challenges are emergent is that all of us adapt our behavior in response to uh, the emergent phenomena. So if you go outside and you find it's hot, you will um, wear different sort of clothes. If you go outside and find it cold, you'll um, put some clothes on. So we adapt to the phenomena that we, or to situations we find ourselves in. And what happens is that because of these two things, because of emergence and um, adaptive behavior, we actually get lots of new information about the system and our situation being generated. So one of the characteristics of complex systems is that they generate massive amounts of information. And what always um, amuses me, um, a little bemuses me, I have to say, about the dominant response is that often the reaction to uh, the confusion of information is to request more information. So can we publish a report? Can we study the phenomena um, that we're seeing? And of course, the phenomena is changing all the time. So what you just get is um, more and more information being generated to the point where it's actually, in practical terms, impossible to fully uh, review or understand the information that is out there. Um, so information is some of the, some of the, one of the key challenges, if you like. Um, and the increase and the dramatic increase of information that we're seeing out in the world is a, is a key characteristic of, of um, complexity. So those are, those are really the three, um, uh, the three things that characterize complex situations. Um, and what we get is we get a dominant response. And the dominant response is historic. Uh, so this is how governments, corporations, um, civil society organizations, nonprofits respond uh, to the challenge of complexity. So we see um, we see a challenge with our food systems, or we see a uh, challenge with our healthcare systems or education, and um, the bulk of our resources, so the bulk of government resources, the bulk of um, corporate resources, if you like, um, and money, really are invested in plans of some sort or the other. And <clears throat> the, the big challenge with that is that most strategic plans fail. So the, the data uh, on strategic plans failing comes from a a Canadian, actually, um, a professor at McGill University called Henry Mintzberg, who studies strategic planning. And um, he defines uh, planning as having these three characteristics uh, on the slide here, in that they are predictive. So we attempt to predict the future. We say, this is what's going to happen in the next five years, or the next three years, or, or the duration of our plan. And they're formalized in the sense that they're written down. So someone actually has to be able to articulate in writing uh, the steps of the plan or uh, the elements that constitute the plan and obviously the planning is done by people who are relatively detached um, from the situation so planners, experts, people who can bring an objective position um, on the challenges that uh, we're trying to deal with. So that really is um, the nature of the dominant response and um, my argument and, and the argument that I'm making in the book is that the, the planning-based response, um, whether it takes place in the corporate sector, in some society, or in government, is really uh, neo-Soviet in its approach. It's, it's, so the, the, the primary example of 
a society that's organized around planning, um, in this case central planning, was the Soviet Union, um, and the Soviet Union failed because uh, planning is ill-suited to situations of increasing complexity. So the argument I make in the book and the argument I'm making here is that uh, we're actually applying a paradigm and approach, a set of tools, if you like, that are dramatically ill-suited to uh, the challenge of complexity, um, which is defined by these three characteristics. And um, this kind of uh, this cartoon sums it up for me in some ways. Um, uh, my, my, my contention is that planning is a form of work avoidance. It's actually not really work. Um, we think we're dealing with the issue. We think we're doing work. We think we're trying to, uh, we're making progress and addressing the challenge, but we're not really, um, we're not really doing that. We're doing uh, planning, basically. Um, so this kind of leads us to the, the social lab. Um, so the background on social labs is that um, uh, they, uh, have been going for, we've been running social labs for about 10 years, um, and we ran what I call a set of first generation social labs, um, which were really prototype social labs. And um, from the last 10 years of observing, practicing, and thinking about social labs, um, uh, think about labs in particular, the concept of a social lab is, has been articulated. And, um, and there are three characteristics um, of a social lab, and we can talk a little bit about um, how this works in practice uh, maybe later on. But the three characteristics of social labs are that um, the people who are actually running the lab or uh, doing the work are uh, a diverse team. So there's a diverse team of stakeholders that are doing the work rather than a single class of stakeholders. So for example, in an academic institution, you'll have academics um, who are trained in a particular way working on a problem. Uh, or in a, in a scientific laboratory or a medical laboratory, you'll have a particular class of scientists working on the problem. Um, and similarly, in, in, in government, you'll have technocrats um, and, and a certain type of uh, person working on these problems. And the distinction uh, between a social lab and other forms of labs are that you bring together a team that is truly diverse. So it's people that constitute uh, the system that you're trying to change. Um, so if you're trying to address education, then you have everyone from parents to teachers to administrators um, and people who basically think education is a bad idea. Um, and uh, and one of the reasons for this is that if you don't have a diverse team, so you have a team that's homogeneous, what you get is grouping. So you get a lot of people who agree on the definition of the problem. They agree what the nature of the problem is, but they don't really have uh, that many ideas on solutions. So what you get is you get um, you get a lot of energy being invested, but not a lot of forward movement. So that's one characteristic. The second characteristic is the process or the approach that we take. Um, and in some ways, it's relatively simple. The approach is essentially trial and error. The idea is that you will try something out, you see what happens, and then you try again based on what you see. So the process is iterative. But in a sense, this is the process is why uh, social labs are really called labs, uh, because the approach we're taking is experimental in nature. So uh, unlike a planning-based approach where you define a beginning, a middle, and an end, uh, uh, a lab takes an iterative approach. Um, and then the final characteristic is that a lab, in, 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 if you were to take the strictest definition, it's a space. So if you think about a chemistry lab or a physics lab, um, those are spaces, and inside those spaces, uh, things happen. So the space that we're trying to create um, for social labs is what I would call systemic. And um, systemic doesn't mean that um, it involves understanding systems. Instead, what systemic means is that you're trying to address problems at their root cause, and you try and construct spaces that are amenable to doing that. And, I'll, and again, I'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Um, so these are the three characteristics of uh, social labs. Um, we're running a, a Twitter campaign, so if you want to see examples of social labs, um, we're tweeting details of 100 labs in 100 days, and we've done 30 or 40. Uh, so there's plenty of examples to look at. Um, this is a photograph of, uh, uh, this is my image of before and after uh, labs. So this is a group of um, malnourished kids um, from a lab that we ran, and um, this is the before, and this is my image of the after. Um, Essentially, they saw the picture at this point, um, which is why they're going slightly crazy. Um, I'm going to actually pause there, and um, maybe we can take some questions, and I'll come back to um, uh, 
is to the conclusion of this um, when we have some questions. Does that work? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anyone has a question, just type it in your in your chat box on your screen. I did I did I did say to Susan that um you know we may have perfect comprehension of everything I've been saying and I have no questions, so Questions? Where are we at? I think we've been. Oh, here we go. How to create a shared vision of success. Yep. Why don't we take a couple and then I will, mm -hmm. uh, I'll kind of talk about them. Here's another one going back to strategic. Is that the word? Tokens fail. Are there problems better suited to the planning process? Yeah. So what's planning good for? Yeah. And the diversity of teams, what need is there for different levels of vertical power and authority? Yeah. this kind of work and approach we received by your corporate clients and how to get diverse stakeholders involved right what's the role of the con convener okay all right should I take those and then we can take a few more if we have time mm -hmm. um, so uh, just to start with the shared vision of success um, so what one of the challenges with any uh, situation that comp that's complex is actually um, not the success scenario, but it's the failure scenario. So, with planning, what we get is we get systems that are really too big to fail. So, imagine um, a bank or uh, a government program that where that it's politically unacceptable to allow it to fail. So, what you what you happen what what happens is you get um, services or structures that exist um, that aren't really serving the need they're supposed to serve. Um, but no one can tell whether those have failed or not. Um, so they're kept alive in, in a sense when they're quote dead, um, which alludes back to this idea of the, of the zombie apocalypse. So the challenge actually is to articulate a failure scenario. So how do you know you failed? Uh, and, and to take an example, um, if you want to work on um, gun control in the US uh, um, and you are articulating that uh, you want to uh, legalize or allow people to have guns and uh, and that's uh, the approach you want to take, rather than ban handguns. And how do you know whether you failed or uh, and when do you declare failure? So I would argue that that's one of the challenges. Um, I'm guessing the reason you're asking the question around success is, is in terms of attracting people to the lab. So why would someone join a lab? Um, and this is linked a little bit to the question about corporate clients and, um, and, and convening. So. I think one of the challenges in convening a diverse team is what is the carrot and what's the stick? So why would people choose to invest their time and energy in a lab as opposed to doing any number of other things they could do? Um, and there, there's two answers to that. So one is obviously what do I get from joining the lab? Um, and the other, uh, the other answer to the question is, well, what is it that attracts you uh, to the mission of the lab, if you like? So. At the center of labs, really, is um, a goal or an ambition. And that goal and ambition uh, ideally needs to be fairly broad. And if it's broad, then you can essentially attract a diverse group of stakeholders. The narrower that scope and ambition is, the less, uh, the less broad your coalition will be, in a sense. Um, and you know, we've had a lot of success historically in um, corporations supporting labs. And part of that, I'm assuming, goes back to the fact that, you know, Corporations fund labs and run internal labs all the time. So, in some ways, the language is not unfamiliar. Um, and I think part of it is also that there is potentially uh, less accountability in corporate structures when compared to public money. So, corporations are actually able to take a much more experimental approach. Um, and then the other thing I would just say about the corporate um, culture is that, in, in some ways, you can contrast um, a planning based culture to being something like the Soviet Union. And you can look at something like Silicon Valley as a prototyping-based culture. So 
in, in, in Silicon Valley, investments are made in startups on the basis of teams and how good your team is, not on how good your plan is. So that would be a, a, a counterculture, if you like, to a planning-based culture. Um, what's planning good for? So, so planning is good for putting a man on the moon. So if you have a problem that has a very clear problem definition and a very clear solution definition, then planning essentially will work. Um, and what planning will do in that instance is it will control inputs and outputs and deliver them at the right place at the right time in order to solve a problem that is complicated but not complex in nature. So planning, in, in a sense, can work for technical uh, technical challenges. Um, what's the other question? Uh, vertical power and authority. Yeah, so the one other way of understanding a lab is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to bring a, a group of stakeholders together um, who have different perspectives on what needs to happen. And what we are trying to do with those uh, stakeholders is that we're trying to get them to agree on a portfolio of approaches for how to move forward and to test those approaches. But the way to come up with those approaches in practice is it's a negotiation. So you bring people together, people express what they think, and we've got to converge them somehow, uh, not on, on one thing to do, but on several things to do. And that convergence involves uh, power and power dynamics. So we try to convene teams that have a diversity of power, um, but within the context of the lab, what we're trying to do is we're trying to equalize power dynamics so people can essentially look at the situation and make decisions on what they believe rationally needs to be done in the situation. So make those decisions on the basis of rationality, not on the basis of power or conflict. So that's. Uh, so that's a real challenge, and that's part of the skill set of uh, running labs. Other questions? I don't know if I'm answering these questions to anyone's satisfaction. So, um, um. so I, there's a, a few questions that focus on how is this the same or different than other things that people are familiar with. So, is this just yeah. an is this a ch all about change labs, or is it about other types of labs like mind lab? How is it different from just a workshop? How right, is it right, connected right. to transformative scenario planning? How, how is this right. fitting in that whole cluster right. of things? Right. Um, so in terms of the ecology of uh, labs, how does this and where does this fit? So in, um, in, in the book, I talk about change labs as first generation labs. And um, really, there's a set of characteristics, if you like, of um, early labs that um, what I would call next generation labs or social labs um, are moving on from. So the, the thing that I think um, has struck me most of all about labs that have been run so far has been the voluntary and part-time nature of the labs. Um, so that's one, one thing. that The assumption, the mental picture, if you like, that um, I most often see and that we have had um, really until now uh, has been that you, know, you, you will go to a workshop or you'll go to something um, and participate in it and then you'll go back to your day job. And the analogy I would use is that if you imagine an amateur team compared to a professional team, and a professional team would be doing this full time, all the time, um, in order to in order to address the challenge, and, a, and an amateur team would be doing this part time as a as a side activity to uh, their day job. So you know you go to a workshop for three days and you go back to work. So I think that that's one of the biggest differences. I would say that. My argument is that in order to actually tackle these problems um, and these challenges that are complex in nature, we need stable platforms. So uh, again, if you imagine tackling a problem like um, cancer or AIDS, it's pretty hard to imagine making progress if you're going to a three-day workshop, working on the problem, and then going back to your day job, which takes a completely different approach to solving the problem. So that's one of the key differences, I think, between um, between historically what we've seen, first generation labs and um, and next generation labs, um, and then there there are a bunch of more technical differences uh, as well. Um, and you know, I have a, I have a there's a document online um, at the blog uh, uh, on the website sociallabs.org, and um, there's an article there. There's a there's a table there which basically outlines the difference between first generation labs and next generation labs. So that table will go into some uh, more of the technical differences, but I do think there are key differences, and I think the biggest challenge that we face in trying to address these problems is the, um, the piecemeal nature of the, the approach. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that helps. Susan, does that, um, do, you have, do, you have, do, you, do you have kind of a build on that or further elaboration on that, or is that okay? 
Um, yeah, I think that's good. I think there's another side to the question that's popping up around is complexity really just a, a euphemism for things that aren't working or grief and despair and how do, how do labs play a role in really getting at some of the those underlying issues and, and can they be used in major international crises like what we're seeing in the Middle East and so on. Right. So, do you want to address that? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, to, to take the first part of the, the question first, which is the easier part, um, I, I, obviously I think I think one thing to remember is the idea of a, uh, the, a lab isn't necessarily what you go public with, so you don't necessarily go and intervene in the Middle East and say we want to run up the lab with all the communication challenges that would entail. But the approach, I think, um, of bringing diverse stakeholders together to try and address a situation that seems to be devolving and... Um, getting worse, where people are suffering, I think, is extremely apt. So, um, so in the book, one of the main cases uh, that I talk about is, is Yemen, uh, which is one of the most populous countries in the Middle East and is going through um, really every one of the problems that, or challenges that we worked on piecemeal. So, you know, food, um, food security, malnutrition, energy, conflict, they're, they're all happening at the same time, um, what I kind of call the perfect storm of complexity. And I think... Um, the idea of bringing together a group of diverse stakeholders who, who to work together in a way that is experimental, um, initiative, um, that tries to address the problems at their root cause, is extremely apt for a lot of the challenges we're facing. Um, and I say that because one of the other challenges, one of the other problems with the um, situations like conflict um, in the Middle East and so on is that if you look close enough, you'll actually see that there's actually no strategy for how to deal with them. So there's a, there's a lot of reaction, um, there's a lot of energy invested in them, but there really isn't a strategy of how you deal with them. And so what labs uh, do is they provide a, a strategy, and now that strategy might fail, but they give you a direction to try and approach these challenges in. Um, and I could see labs working in um, fragile states all over the world, so I could see them working in you know, in, in, in places like South Sudan, we just got back from Nigeria where we're talking about potentially doing something um, in some of the Nigerian states where conflict is kind of high. Um, and, and again, um, uh, this is a me message that's kind of in the book, um, labs aren't um, a silver bullet. So, you know, similar to a medical challenge like cancer or AIDS, just because you have a laboratory doesn't mean you have a solution to the problem. What it means is that you have a container um, in which to explore uh, potential solutions and eliminate things that are really dead ends, um, and you have a strategy that you can employ to uh, try and tackle these challenges. And I think that um, the presence of a strategy or potential approach, I think, is a shift from trying to address um, problems like you know, Syria or even the Israel-Palestine crisis um, without um, any semblance of a strategy. Other questions? We've got two minutes left, I think, for the Q&A. Susan, did you have anything? Well, there's some intriguing questions about what does it mean to address the root? How do you know you've got to the root of an issue? Right, right. Um, so one way of distinguishing the root of an issue um, to not the root is essentially addressing symptoms as opposed to the root causes. So, if uh, if people are hungry and you are shipping in food, um, you're actually dealing with the symptom and not the root cause of why people are hungry. Um, so, um, and and the other thing I would say is that a little bit like sustainability, um, trying to be systemic and trying to address something at the root cause is is um, a lot about um, the attitude and the stance you take and um, how you track the implications of what's going on down to at least um, down to a causal level, if possible. There's this great video of, um, of, uh, of Matt Damon and Goodwill Hunting, um, where he's asked to, he's asked why he shouldn't join the NSA. And, um, you know, you can find it online, but he, in, in about three minutes, he summarizes um, a chain of events that leads from him joining the NSA down to, you know, uh, a village getting bombed and, and leading back to one of his friends at home, essentially suffering as a result of what he's done. But essentially, being systemic is a matter of attitude and, and approach and how 
you're looking for a causal response and going beyond beyond the symptomatic response. Which sounds, um, it's easy to say, it's very hard to do, obviously. One more question, and then we can, I'm going to go back to these slides and try and wrap up a little bit. Can you talk about moving from the lab to action and when you know you're being successful? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this goes a little bit back to the failure scenario that I talked about, that uh, it, it's, it's relatively hard to articulate a failure scenario, so when, when do you know you failed as opposed to when you know you've succeeded. Um, and I also think the other thing that's extremely important to remember about labs is that they are an attempt to act in response to a problem rather than study a problem and then propose a solution. So what we're trying to do with, with labs is um, and taking a experimental prototyping approach is to get to action as soon as possible to test something out in the real world, see how that is um, received and uh, what kind of benefits it produces in society and then rapidly iterate if it isn't successful. So, in some ways, the idea of, of a lab and taking experimental approach is that you, you want to take your pet ideas for what's gonna, what you think is going to work and you want to stress test them and you want to break them as soon as possible. So if they're going to break, you want them to break early and not far down the line. So what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to test ideas in the real world rapidly, quickly, um, and move, um, move from what you've learned and, and redesign and rebuild based on what you've learned. So it's really... Um, Really, I think one of the most challenging aspects of labs is that you're not just studying a problem and writing a report, you're actually trying to move into action. And that means also there's a set of preconditions for action. And the preconditions we talk about are that you need resources, you need the right people, and the right people are people who are committed to uh, working on the challenge that you've, uh, you've identified as long as it needs, as it required, really. Um, and then the third thing is you need some sense of strategic direction, you need some sense of okay, what direction should we be moving in? Um, and we're going to test um, ideas that help us move in that direction. Um, so those preconditions are quite important. And I'll go back. I'm, I'm actually going to move back to the slides because um, it relates a little bit to um, this question. Um, is that okay, Susan, for me to continue? Yeah, that would be great. Thinking, that's fine. So let me just show you, go back here. Um, so, so one of the things that's characteristic of the dominant response is that um, the bulk of resources go into planning-based responses. So if you think about the government budget and you think about you know, where government budget goes beyond um, things like social security or in direct in, in investment infrastructure, um, a lot of the resources are how resources are spent are determined by um, plans. And the challenge I think a lot of us have um, in not buying into the planning approach is uh, what I call the World Cup problem. And the World Cup problem, <clears throat> in essence, is that we set ourselves uh, the target of winning a World Cup. So, you know, addressing climate change, um, eradicating poverty, child malnutrition, uh, whatever it is. But essentially a problem that is um, at, at the level of World Cup, a, a, a a problem that really requires a serious investment of resources, um, and we don't really have those resources. So we're willing to run a three-day workshop, but we're not willing to quit our jobs and work for the next ten years on uh, the particular challenge that we want to address. Um, and the the World Cup problem, in in a, in a sense, is a problem of grounding. So what kind of resources, um, what kind of team do you need uh, in order to address these problems? Um, and um, for, for me, is that the reflection that's interesting about this is that it often seems to hinge on resources, but it's not actually about resources. It's actually about the will to keep working on the problem for long enough um, to get good at it and to uh, solve it, if you like. So the image I've got up here is um, a picture of the, the Brazilian team from 1970 that won uh, the World Cup against Italy. And Brazil at the time was one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and yet they won a World Cup. And um, in terms of the challenges that we're trying to address, and in terms of um, the scale of the challenges, if you like, what we need more than anything else is a team that is full-time, permanent, and focused on addressing 
uh, these challenges. Um, and that obviously presents its own resource problems and so on, but really what we're talking about is um, the key resource that we're trying to marshal, if you like, in order to address these problems is a willingness to experiment and a willingness to keep at it for as long as, um, as, long as needed, really. Um, and the question is how do you convince people um, to do that and what is it that you, what kind of case do you need to make um, in, order, in order to get people to, if you like, abandon business as usual responses and approaches, um, things that they've done traditionally, things that they're comfortable with, and try something that is difficult, unpredictable, and um, requires, a, if you like, a skill set that's much broader than the ones we have. <coughs> Okay, so why do social labs work? Um, so this this diagram is from um, Henry Mintzberg, but <coughs> what we're really trying to do with social labs is we're trying to form an emergent strategy that is responsive to the situations that we find ourselves in. And if you see the arrows on the on the top, um, if you like, intended strategy and deliberate strategy are single strategies that will either work or fail. Whereas with emergent strategy, what you're trying to do is you're trying to come up with a portfolio, a broad portfolio of responses, and you're trying to test each one of those, and they're all moving towards a, a particular direction. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the necessity of, of doing this work and um, this idea of the, um, the zombie apocalypse. Um, so planning... Um, in my opinion, is a zombie idea. It's an idea that really doesn't work when applied to complexity, um, but despite having failed many, many times, we keep coming back, and in some ways it's a dead idea that's very much alive. Um, these, um, these very boring looking graphs are, um, are one reason why uh, planning-based approaches aren't really going to work in the situation we find ourselves in. So if you look at these graphs, these are all um, um, a set of statistics around around Yemen. Um, so the top left hand graph is population, which is going up. Um, the top right hand graph is energy use per capita. Then, if you look at the graphs below, what you see is um, renewable uh, renewable freshwater resources for Yemen, which are going down. And then you have agriculture and agricultural productivity, which is also going down. So what you see with these graphs is essentially a set of divergent trends. So you see. Um, that there's more and more people with less and less water, there's more energy usage and less and less agriculture. Um, and the question is, what happens at the end of these graphs? So if these trends continue to diverge, um, what do we get? So what we get is a situation like this. So this is a picture from Detroit. Um, and uh, I think it's the Detroit train station um, that's been abandoned for a long time. But what you essentially get is um, when you see a situation um, is characterized by these couple of trends is you get the collapse of basic infrastructure. Um, and that infrastructure starts to degrade, but eventually it's unusable and it, and it collapses. And what I think we're seeing right now, um, you know, with parallels to the Soviet Union, is we're seeing a set of trends in society that are really divergent. More people, uh, less food, less water, um, increased energy use. So demand for natural resources is going up. Um, and um, we're depleting those resources. Now, the interesting thing is that if you talk to optimists, they'll basically tell you that technology is changing um, our resource use patterns. So, you know, we're getting more and more energy from solar and the price of solar is dropping. So, in some ways, these trends can be affected by uh, technological innovation. The challenge at the moment is that they're not being affected fast enough by technological innovation. And if these trends continue, then what we're, what we're heading towards is essentially collapse of um, vital ecosystems and um, systems that we really uh, depend on to survive. Um, so what we've actually got is we've got a window of opportunity. Um, we've got a window of opportunity where we can arrest, if you like, um, and address the engines that are driving these trends um, uh, and address them at the root cause because what we're trying to do is really disrupt those trends. And um, labs are really a vehicle for asking the question and figuring out how we do that. Um, and I don't believe we can rely on technological innovation to arrest those uh, those trends. But that's basically what I've got. Um, and again, we've got time for um, questions and answers, and I wanted to focus um, time on that. So again, like other other questions that are coming up from people, um, things you want to hear more about. But what's what's uh, coming up for people?
can stop sharing the screen. Over to you, Susan. Are we there? Just waiting a minute to see if there's any new okay. questions coming in. I know that there's a, a lot that haven't been answered yet. Um, so okay. I don't know where to be. Where to begin. Okay. But is there is there any response to just this last bit, or I could go back and look for some of the questions that haven't been answered? It'd be lovely to have an open conversation, but that's not quite possible. Right. Um, what patterns of successful labs do you see, and any principles that they have in common? Okay. Other questions? And somebody asked, can you say something about how something that is experimental can be simultaneously strategic? And somebody else right. uh, seconded that question. Okay. Okay. Good question. And then there's a few actually from before about if social labs are not a tool or a method, how could you describe what it is exactly? Okay. Or, or is that? Okay, let me let me let me take those. Um, okay. So, um, okay, I'm going to start with that last question of what social ads actually are. So, if you um, if you take the analogy of cooking and you think about a kitchen and you think about what you have in the kitchen, what you have in the kitchen are tools. <coughs> so you know, utensils, knives, forks. Um, plates and so on, um, and obviously you've got somebody who is trying to cook, uh, and you have the process of cooking. So, so a social lab really is the space that's constituted for those activities to take place in. So what you're actually trying to do with a social lab is you're trying to create a space that isn't owned by one entity, um, that is open and amenable to supporting experimentation on trying to address challenges that are complex in nature. And into that space you bring lots of different people, lots of different tools, um, processes and approaches that are experimental uh, in nature. So, t at its strictest sense, a social lab is a space, just like a chemistry lab or a physics lab. Um, I think the interesting thing about social labs is that, and, and that the makes them quite hard to grasp, is that we're used to the idea of a lab as being a fixed space. You know, you have a, you have a bench, you have a Bunsen burner, you have a fixed set of equipment and fixed architecture in space, and in that space you experiment. Because social labs are social in nature, um, the lab really is not um, in a building, it's not something that's fixed in nature. So when we run labs, we take people into communities to live there and see people who are trying to deal firsthand with the challenges um, of, say, child malnutrition. So uh, the, the, the systemic nature of the space is then going into those communities and using that space as a, as a learning space. And similarly, so a lab is, <coughs> a social lab is already constituted of several different spaces. And in those spaces, you have processes that unfold and you bring tools in um, to allow people to really think about what will work in the situation. So, you know, I would draw the analogy between sort of an existing laboratory or a kitchen mm -hmm. just to fix that in your, in your mind. Um, so a lab is really the field of practice. Um, it's the physical space that you take people into in order to learn, learn the realities of a problem and to test those solutions out. So that's the first, last question, really. Um, and then um, there's this question about patterns of successful labs and principles. Um, I think one of the challenges with, one of the real challenges with labs is that they are not projects. Um, so a project typically has a beginning and an end where you define what the outcomes are. And with a lab what you're doing is you're actually running an ongoing investigation, an ongoing experiment on solutions and what might work and what, what won't work. And what you're trying to do really, what we're trying to do is be disciplined about those. We're trying to really try something out and if it fails, we have to build the capacity to let go of that failure and say, that's not going to work. Um, uh, and um, when we see something working, we get behind it and we try and, and make that work. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of a successful uh, lab. So the Sustainable Food Lab is one of the first labs um, that we ran, and it's been going for about uh, 10 years. And um, it brought together initially 22 people who were looking at the sustainability of the food system and asking the question of how can we make the global food system more sustainable. Um, so that
that group of people has now grown to a number of organizations, so 60 or 70 organizations, and the lab has really become a platform for experimentation and trying things out that are uh, that are uh, that will make the global food system more systemic. So there are many things that were tried in the lab that have failed. So probably of the six or seven initiatives that we uh, initially articulated or, or, or uh, put out there, um, half of them or more than half of them have failed. Um, but um, in, there are a number that have worked and a number that are continuing. And what happens is that um, people keep proposing, if you like, new experiments and trying those experiments out. So the lab has really become a stable platform for experiment experimentation around, you know, creating a uh, global food system that is sustainable. And there's, there's lots of documentation and material online that people can, can look at. Um, so that would be an example. And, it, and I, I'm not sure um, I know the answer as to what the patterns are with successful labs beyond the three that I, I named. So um, labs that are social, so the people who are running the labs are actually a diverse uh, set of stakeholders rather than one class of stakeholders. So the participation is social. The process that's undertaken is experimental in nature. You're trying things out in the real world, seeing how they approach, how they work, and then learning from those and building on those. And then the final one is um, that you're taking a, an approach to systemic in nature. So you're trying to look at the root cause of why people are hungry, why are children are malnourished, and you know why are we emitting carbon and so on. Um, so you're looking at the causal factors as much as possible uh, around. Uh, around the challenge that you want to address. So I would say that those three characteristics really need to be baked into a lab from the very beginning. Um, and those are the three characteristics I would argue that, you know, I've seen over the last 10 years or last 15 years of trying this out that have, uh, have worked. If you like. um, and then there's this question of being experimental and strategic at the same time. So that is a good question. Um, I think I'm going to answer that. So, so one of the most common understandings of strategy is, is, is strategy is planning. So when we think often about doing strategy, we're actually talking about strategic planning. We're talking about studying a situation, looking at a situation, articulating a plan, writing down the plan, and then executing the plan. Um, and that is one conception of strategy. Uh, another conception of what strategy is, which, which goes back to uh, Mintzberg and Henry Mintzberg, is that strategy is action. And if you, if you think about the arrows, um, Let's get back up. If you think about the arrows um, in the diagram, so if you think about this diagram here, um, when in the context of a of a of a lab, when uh, I use the word strategy, what I mean is strategy is action. So. If you like, each of these arrows is a little experiment that points towards how to make the global food system sustainable, um, or tells us a little bit more about how we can tackle child malnutrition in India, or how we can come up with how we can reduce global emissions. And the idea is that each one of these experiments gives us a bit more of a clue and a bit more of an understanding as to how you can meet some of these um, really ambitious goals and targets, and how you can actually address some of these situations you know, like in the Middle East, a conflict situation um, with action, really, rather than a strategy that is abstract, um, you know, tries to predetermine the future and is really detached from the situation on the ground. Does that, I hope that answers um, the question. Do we have other questions? So, I mean, those are three questions that we had. I'm sure there are lots more questions. Oh, well, there's lots of you. questions. There's, yeah, I think we won't get to them all. Um, okay. Maybe one more. Some people are wondering when you, again, talk about the relationship with planning, okay. is there a way that planning can work alongside or be part of a social lab, or are they mutually exclusive? I mean, the question that that brings up for me is why would you want to do that? Um, you know, so if you've got a technical a problem that's technical in nature that's really clearly defined, um, then you can take a planning based approach. The other thing I would just say is that in the context of the lab, it's not as if we don't do action planning. So I'm talking about strategic planning, and particularly the idea that you you have centralized strategic planning um, that articulates uh, you know a five year plan on paper uh, for how we need to address the situation. So there's a particular form of planning that I'm actually uh, criticizing. I'm not talking about um, you know 
not doing resource planning or action planning or thinking about the future per se. So I hope that kind of clarifies it. But, but the main question that raises for me is, you know, what would the purpose of planning be? Who's it helping? Who's it for? Um, you know, why are we doing it? And um, and the caution I would I would have is that, um, you know, the dominant response to complex challenges is, is a function of habit. It's what we have always done and it's what, what we're used to doing. So uh, the question is, how do we break out of our habit? Because those habits aren't really serving us anymore. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Is there one or two more that we can get to before we end? I'll try and be quick. Here's a quite a practical one, um, bringing together multi-stakeholder group you really need a commitment over a period of time and how do you keep people together how do you keep the group together um over time have you cracked that code um so i guess there, so there are multiple answers to the question and and the main one is that you know um it's the same as forming any organization you know the challenge of keeping a team together is the same challenge that anyone that's run an organization or tried to even, you know, coach a, a football team has, which is how do you ensure people stay committed? How do you, how do you ensure people are, uh, uh, stick with, stick with the program, if you like. And, um, you know, there are, the, the, there are carrots and there are sticks, you know, so people engaging in meaningful work and doing, doing work that really addresses situations of complexity, I think is a, is a, is a big reward these days. So, you know, we get a lot of people contacting us wanting to work on these problems and not really knowing where to start or how to start. So, um, I think, I think you know, the big, the big, um, uh, the fuel, if you like, that drives people to participate in these things is that they they have, they have an opportunity to do really meaningful work and contribute to something that they care deeply about. And if you can figure out that alignment of getting people who really care deeply about the issue that you want to address or you know that we want to address, then I think you'll get that. You'll get that. Um, you'll you'll get that kind of cohesion, and there always there there's always going to be a, a degree of churn. There's always going to be a degree of people falling out of that and wanting to exit from something because you know when they get into it they find it's really not for them. Um, but I would say you know it's it's a it's a the challenges of, of finding talent and keeping talent are you know a, a well recognized challenge in any kind of organizational context. If that helps. I don't know if that helps. That might be a <laughs> well, thank you, Zaid. I think we should probably start to, to mm -hmm. close. I think sure. some of the, the things you've said about really uh, the importance of just being able to shift people's thinking towards building a platform for experimentation rather than going down the business as usual route is really um, the biggest hurdle. And I think that you're your book and how you've laid out clearly some of the learning and the principles and the successes and, um, and the rationale for all of this will help many of us who are trying to, to move in this direction. So <clears throat> thank you so much for today, but also for your work in general. And um, just want to remind everyone that Zayed's book is going to be ready for distribution on February 4th, and it can be pre-ordered now on Amazon. And the Kindle version is actually available now if you want to get it today and, and read more. A lot of what um, Zaid has touched on is, is expanded in, in more depth in, in the book. Uh, I just want to let you know that we've just confirmed that Zaid is going to be joining us at the Alia Europe uh, Leadership Intensive in March 23rd to 29th. So it would be really great if you could... Uh, come along there and meet Zaid and maybe get a few tips about your own lab project. Um, and he's also going to be coming through Halifax as part of a very extensive book tour that he's going to be doing over the next number of months. But he'll be giving a public talk here. So if you're in Halifax, watch for that news for February 13th. Um, our next webinar is a week from today, January 29th, and our guest will be Gwenda O. Young, who will be talking about adaptive action and giving us practical tools for working with complexity. 
um, I find that she's really brilliant at making complex ideas very simple and practical and applicable. So if you haven't already registered for that one, just go to our website. There's a link on the main page, on the home page, for the Tools for Transformation series. Go there and you'll see a link to register. Um, we have two more, including Glenda's, another one as well, another, a third webinar uh, scheduled. So you can uh, register for that now. But we're waiting to see how these go and what the interest is before we uh, go forward and, and um, plan for some more. But if you have ideas, uh, please send those along to us. If you'd like to support support us in, in maintaining this um, software and just pulling this all together, there's a donate button at the bottom of the webinars page and we'd really appreciate that support. And finally, if you're planning to join us at the Summer Leadership Intensive in Washington in June, uh, the deadline for the early bird discount is coming right up on the 31st, so you might want to go ahead and register for that now. I'd like to, to thank you, Zaid, and, and also invite you to say any last uh, comments sure. that you'd like to make. Um, thank you, Susan. So just a couple of things. Um, there's a website, uh, which is uh, www.social-labs.org. Um, there are a lot of case studies on the website uh, that you can download, and obviously there are case studies in the book. So two chapters in the book are actually um, in-depth uh, case studies of, of labs. Um, so for the people that are looking for examples, those are the places to go. One is online, one is in um, the book. Um, the link again is www.social-labs.org. Um, then the other thing is, I'm, as Susan said, I'm going to be on tour from early February. I'm going to be in, uh, starting in Boston uh, and, uh, and then uh, New York, and then I'll be on the, on the West Coast, and I'll be in, in Canada as well. So I think I'm going to almost every major city in Canada. But um, what I wanted to say was that if you have questions that really uh, you haven't been able to get answers to, um, then you know you can also email me. I'm happy to get into dialogue. I can't promise the quickest response, but. Um, my email address is also hassan at realspartners.com. Uh, um, there's the website, you can look at more resources. But really, um, just to close, um, what I'd like to say is that I think, I think what has really struck me over the last 10 years of doing this work is that a lot of the challenges that we're seeing uh, are a function of our ability to, uh, to really um, break out of our own habits and how we address them. And what this work has left me with, if you like, um, has been that I'm much more hopeful than I've ever been about our ability to address these things, even as this goes to scale of these challenges grow. Um, but that involves all of us talking to each other and working with each other. So my hope is that the next year I'm able to engage with you all uh, one on one and have uh, conversations and get into some depth around these things. Um, and this is really uh, the beginning. So I want to thank um, Susan, the team at ALIA, uh, and the ALIA Institute for organizing this, and hopefully uh, we'll see you.